Hello everyone, thank you for coming. Welcome to this session of NATO's 36th annual conference. We will be starting in about one minute. Before we begin, we want to cover a few housekeeping items. On your attendee screen, you will be able to enter comments and questions in the audience chat. We hope you will take advantage of this opportunity to engage with our speakers. This session is being recorded. The recording will be available in approximately one day by returning to this session in the agenda. We recognize and thank our Petabyte sponsor, the California Healthcare Foundation. All conference sponsors have virtual booths available during the conference in the sponsors section. At the booths, you can learn more about the sponsors, review materials, request contact, and collect game tokens. We hope all attendees will take a few minutes to visit each sponsor's booth. During each conference session, watch for a game token that you can collect for a chance to win a grand prize worth $250 or one of several prizes worth $50. Now I will turn the stage over to Norm Thurston, NATO's Executive Director, who will start today's session. Norm, do you have... Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you. For NATO's 36th annual conference, Rising to the Challenge, Connecting Data with Policy. My name is Norm Thurston. I am an Executive Director at NATO, the National Association of Health Data Organizations. I would like to recognize the various sponsors that have made this conference possible. They've done so much to make this happen, and we want to really thank them. We would ask that you each take a moment to visit them in a sponsor's feature and find out how they are supporting efforts to collect analyze and disseminate health data. I would also like to recognize NATO strategic partners. Our partners are NATO members that have chosen to engage at a higher level. At the highest level, Milliman Med Insight is a NATO collaborating partner. At the next level, NATO's feature, featured partners include Very Dunn, Comagine Health, Friedman Healthcare, Human Services Research Institute or HSRI, IBM Watson Health, MedicaSoft, OnPoint Health Data, and Optum. Thank you, partner. NATO's Board of Directors is composed of 15 volunteers representing all of NATO's membership. The board is led by Karen Lee Harrington from MHDO, who is the chair, and Michael Lundberg from VHI, the vice chair. I want to express my appreciation to our board for their time and efforts to help guide NATO. They put in a lot of time to make this organization great. This conference was planned by NATO's Program Planning Committee. This year's conference co-chairs are Craig Schneider and Kevin McAvey. This group has put in hundreds of hours to identify topics of interest, organize sessions, and recruit and support panelists and presenters. Thank you, Planning Committee. We truly could not have done this without you. I want to call your attention to a few pro tips that can enhance your conference experience. First, in the platform, you can see the full conference program including all presenters, sponsors, titles, and times in a single document. You also need to know about the agenda feature, which I assume you found since you're watching the session. Inside that agenda feature, you can build your own personal agenda with the sessions that you want to participate in. By now, you've also heard about our game, the token hunt. There are dozens of words and phrases hidden throughout the conference. As you find one, enter it into the game feature to earn a chance to win Nato's grand prize drawing. Winners will be announced throughout the conference. We highly encourage you also to take advantage of opportunities to engage and network. There are several ways to connect with other attendees, including participating in a network session, going to the sponsor breaks, or finding people through the attendee list. And of course, writing on the wall. Tell everybody that you're here, that you're having a good time and what you find interesting. This year, NATO has partnered with three of our sister associations to bring you crossover content. We had a jointly planned session with NAFSIS during the pre-conference and, and the recording is now available through the agenda platform. Tomorrow, we are pleased to have crossover sessions that were planned jointly with NASHP and IAPHS. We hope you enjoy seeing the connection of, of data and policy. I'd also like to call your attention to NATO's in-person workshop. Now, as much fun as virtual conferences are, there's nothing quite like getting together in person. November 9th and 10th of this year, we will be at the Hotel Andalus in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we invite you to join us. All of the information about our in-person workshop is available on our website. Note that our guaranteed room rate block closes on October 15th, so register as soon as possible. 
At this time, I will turn the stage over to Karen Lee Harrington from the Maine Health Data Organization, who is NADO's, who is NADO's board chair. Karen Lee? On behalf of the Board of Directors for the National Association of Health Aid Organizations, I'd like to welcome you to the organization's 36th annual conference. This is NATO's second annual conference held virtually, and I'm excited to report that there are close to 500 participants that have registered representing 146 organizations from all over the country. This is our largest annual meeting to date in terms of participation and meeting content. This year's theme, Rising to the Challenge, Connecting Data with Policy, builds off of last year's theme, Building a Bridge Between Data and Policy. Although we may not be physically together, we are in this together as we continue to be challenged with the ongoing impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the opioid crisis, the rising cost of prescription drugs, the lack of transparency in healthcare costs and outcomes, and healthcare disparities. These challenges remind us of the importance of a comprehensive, credible healthcare data infrastructure that can be utilized to inform policy at all levels. The National Academy for State Health Policy reported that in 2021, lawmakers across the country introduced over 200 bills to curb health system costs. In my own state of Maine, this was my organization's busiest legislative session. Policymakers and stakeholders better understand the value in using data to help inform policy. In this past session, the healthcare data that my organization collects helped inform policy and potential future policy specific to prescription drug price transparency, reimbursement rates for ambulance services, future investments in primary care, and the establishment of the Office of Affordable Health Care. Many of you across the country have similar examples and experiences of how the data you collect or are planning to collect is or will be used to inform policy. We will hear from our peers and experts over the next three days on how they're using healthcare data to inform policy and what some of the challenges and, op challenges and opportunities are as we move forward. I'd like to thank the following. All the attendees and presenters for taking your time that these days there does not seem to be enough of to participate in NATO's annual meeting. For those attending the various sessions, please make comments and ask questions during the presentations attend and participate in the networking events, and please visit the sponsors' booths. For those presenting, your experience and knowledge is invaluable. This event would not be possible without the support of our conference sponsors. And I'd also like to acknowledge the members of the Program Planning Committee, Norm and Charles, for your support, guidance, and expertise in planning and organizing this year's annual meeting. I'm always amazed at the amount of work and coordination involved in pulling together this event. We hope that the speakers and sessions this year provide you with insight and information that you can take back and apply to your work and provokes questions that will lead to more discussion both internally and within your larger networks. Please take advantage of networking virtually as it is so important as we work to strengthen our data community. Again, on behalf of the NATO Board of Directors, thank you for participating in NATO's 36th annual meeting and for your ongoing support of the organization. Thank you, Karen Lee. It's been a delight to have you here with us today. We will now hear a word from our sponsor, Jen Toms from OnPoint Health Data. I'd like to welcome everyone to NATO's opening plenary session and say good morning from Maine. I'm Jen Toms, OnPoint Health Data's Manager of Business Development. We're honored to sponsor NATO in this important annual conference. And on behalf of OnPoint, I'm excited to introduce today's opening plenary did COVID expose a health IT failure, shortfall, or was it an accelerant to health data optimization? The COVID-19 pandemic has brought the crucial importance of health IT and data interoperability to the forefront of many national and global discussions. Since the World Health Organization designated COVID a pandemic in March of 2020, hundreds of millions of people around the globe have been infected and we continue to feel the physical, emotional, and economic effects of the virus. The pandemic shattered many beliefs about pre-pandemic scopes of health IT efforts and highlighted the importance of rapid and high quality health data collection and dissemination 
while proving that healthcare is truly no longer a local or single state issue. We're excited to hear today's panel of experts present their thoughts on the impacts that COVID has had on the landscape of health IT, especially here in the US. And with that, I would like to turn things over to Patricia Merriweather Argus of Project Patient Care, who is the organizer of today's panel. Thank you. Pat, go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you, Norm, and thank you, everyone. It's, it's wonderful to be with all of you today. And this is a very exciting panel to open with. You know, oftentimes we thought, you know, how does data affect policy? I, there's there's uh, nothing that has happened in many years that really points to the connection between data and policy and fast changing policy. I'm very excited today that we have a great group of panelists, um, really leaders in this field. And uh, we have with us today, uh, Mary Beth Conroy or Josh Clem, uh, and Josh Clem from the New York State Department of Health, Helen Figge from Medicare, Medica Soft, Niall Brennan with Healthcare Cost Institute, Craig Brammer, the Healthcare Collaborative, the Health Collaborative, and Claire Cravera with DataVent. And again, an exciting group of people that we're going to be spending time with. And rather than giving the bios on everyone, you have access to the bios, the speaker bios, and you can read all about these magnificent people. So with that, I'm gonna launch into some of our first, uh, our first question. And this is really to get at, so you have a base of understanding, you have a framework from which each of these participants is coming from, uh, because they do have different data, they have different information, regional, state, national, um, local. Uh, again, uh, it will help you in understanding where they're coming from when they start talking about the, the data connection to policy. Um, and I'm gonna start with if, um, actually, if Mary Beth uh, can start, and it's, uh, if you can tell us what data and information does your organization collect, data coverage by the payer type, geographical area, utilization of it, and data and information available to the others outside of your organization. And each panelist has two and a half minutes to do this. So um, again, we'll start with Mary. Okay. Beth. Yeah, can you can you hear me okay? I'm having connection issues. I'm um, going to defer to Josh Clem. You might be able to hear him clearer. Josh? Okay, Josh, you're up. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, this is Josh. Uh, so at our disposal, uh, we are with the New York State Department of Health. Uh, we have surveillance data. Um, examples of that could be you know, newborn screenings, lead poisonings, sur various survey and reporting systems. Uh, many of the hospitalization information and nursing information that we collected during COVID came in through uh, various surveys, uh, registry data, such as vaccinations and cancer, uh, healthcare claims and encounters, whether that's for the, the Medicaid population, commercial, whatever the case may be, they are all lines of business through our all payer database. Uh, we have hospital discharges, uh, that's our Spark system that many, many uh, data users with New York State are familiar with. A lot of that data is available to the external uh, world. Uh, we also have vital events, um, meaning you know, the vital records for the mortality events that occurred. Uh, of the data that we have, what is was made available publicly, um, New York State has been kind of in the, in the national spotlight for a lot of this. So you may be familiar, but we have you know the, the various dashboards for vaccinations, for COVID-19 tracking. Uh, our team in particular is responsible for uh, a few other public data resources and open data tool set known as Health Data New York. Uh, our all-payer database team is also responsible for the New York State Health Connector, which provides uh, public visualizations uh, for various public health data. And then, of course, you know, data is available um, via, via FOIL requests to the department as well. Okay, thank you. Helen Fagan? Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for joining a, a future great uh, conference. Uh, MedicaSoft is a health information technology company. We're headquartered in Arlington, Virginia, and we specialize in the delivery of innovative data platform combined with a health analytics solution. And our, we really truly believe it's all in the data, and that's what NADA stands for as well. 
It's the secured, analyzed, distributed data that could be acted upon it with best practices. And our mission is to really serve healthcare's data to, to transform it and be collected to be useful and meaningful. As we saw with the pandemic coming through and various data pieces, perhaps um, not at, uh, at the fingertips of some. But pertaining to all payer claims databases, we offer an end-to-end -end solution that improves not only the administrative and the public health decisions, but making high quality data available regardless of where it sources. So at the end of the day, um, having a robust engine that has da data validation, transforming and enriching all the data that we can accumulate in healthcare, along with a fire data repository that's required really serves as a stage for people uh, to collect the data and make it really usable and practical. Thank you, Helen. Niall? Morning, everybody. Uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, I run the Healthcare Cost Institute. We are a multi-payer claims database, I guess, uh, uh, and have uh, data claims data from more than 30 different uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans, uh, Aetna and Humana that we analyze to track uh, healthcare spending and utilization uh, in the United States. Uh, over the course of the pandemic, we've also um, partnered uh, with Datavant to uh, enable uh, greater researcher access to uh, more timely data in order to uh, conduct uh, COVID-19 uh, research, and I will let Claire explain a little bit more about that when it's her turn to introduce herself. Okay, thank you. And now to Craig. There we go. Good morning, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here with you all. Uh, Norman team, we uh, uh, have quite a panel here because there's Niall at the national level, Josh covered a state level, and I'm the local guy. So I'm representing some work in Cincinnati, Ohio, which as you know is on the, on the uh, corner of Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. Uh, we have uh, an organization called the Health Collaborative that has, uh, 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 we merged together HealthBridge, which was the first health information exchange in the country. And we still move about 1.5 million clinical results a month on about 3 million lives over a 14 county region. We also have claims data, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial, and a host of other uh, data sets that we're uh, put together in increasingly around SDOH and uh, now more public health data. Uh, uh, side note is that for historical reasons, our organization has for many, many years uh, received ASPR funding to be the disaster res response coordinator for Greater Cincinnati. And uh, candidly, that was not that big of a deal until suddenly it was. And so uh, I, I get to work with people a lot smarter than me that have uh, just done heroic work guiding our community through this pandemic using data. Um, tr tremendous partners from Cincinnati Children's uh, who generously loaned us computational epidemiologists and data scientists to um, really upgrade our skills. And uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but at, at this point in time, or really throughout most of the pandemic, um, our analytics are the touchstone for our entire region. So every morning, uh, leaders from competing health systems look at our data and uh, have situational awareness, and, and we pull from about 12 different data sources to populate our COVID analytics. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. And Claire? Hi, yes, thank Hi. you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow up on Niall's point about the COVID-19 Research Database, which is a, a free public resource at COVID-19 Database, researchdatabase.org. Um, and it is the product of a cross-sector partnership to bring together as much data as possible and make it available to non-commercial researchers for evidence-based policy uh, development, as well as you know, clinical intervention and just more insight into the direct and indirect effects of the, of the pandemic. Uh, it is a HIPAA compliant, de-identified and limited patient level data data set. And it has a, a bunch of different data sets. I'll, I'll just double click into that in just a moment. Um, 87 billion records, it includes uh, EHR commercial data sets that have some of these important SDOH um, socio, so, social determinants of health uh, indicators. Um, we have 
claims data, we have uh, glucose monitoring data. There's a number of different uh, commercial data sources who have opted in to make their data available. And on top of that, we've made it linkable. So that is the, the data van, uh, the data van solution. We have tokenized and made the data um, linkable in a patient privacy preserving manner so that researchers can see a number of different aspects of the patient journey um, and not just see sort of the, the usual data silos. The data sets cover pre-pandemic timeframe as well as the current, uh, the current, uh, the current refresh is, is about weekly or monthly for a couple of the data sources. Um, and we have a rigorous governance and scientific review process on top of this data data source that um, we, we rely very heavily on HCCI and NILS. NILS helped to, to make sure that that was sort of the table stakes, making sure that the governance was sufficient and that everyone felt comfortable with, with all parties coming together to make this available to public sector researchers. And I would just say that we have about 500 researchers actively using the database today, about 30 publications, including a Nature paper just last week. Um, and I, I do, I do invite everyone to come, come and join us. I think it's been um, enormously helpful to have this data available. Um, but happy to also talk about the limitations. I think we've learned a lot with the with the database project. And Claire, just one question that keeps popping up is, what's the uh, website? Can you give us the website? Yep, and I can maybe put it in the chat. It's the COVID nineteen Research Database dot org, okay. and I'll, I'll I'll get it in the chat as well. I, I think that attracted a lot of attention uh, in terms of public information. And speaking of uh, public information, you know, we have so much hospitalization data, and I know sometimes we feel we don't have enough of it, uh, but we have quite a bit. So we were able to really track some of the trends that were occurring and still occurring with surges, with capacity issues, with shifts that had to go on in terms of uh, turning down patients from, you know, uh, elective surgeries. Uh, the areas sometimes that we fell short on were nursing homes. Uh, nursing homes, we knew there was a problem. We just really um, were too late in addressing it. And as a result, um, for a while, it was 60% of all the de COVID deaths in, in the country. So again, I, I think we have an opportunity to expand outside of the hospital and it demonstrates that we do need to have information outside of healthcare, out of hospital care. And then the other was, uh, and this came about rapidly uh, with the CDC, is the increase in the genomic sequencing that went on. Um, where we were able to identify the different variants. At first, you know, Australia was leading the world in terms of uh, doing the sequencing. And as we realized, it was important to understand which variants were coming in and how to trace them and the impact that they would have. So again, I think it, we can see the good and the bad that's going on. But I think from all of your perspectives, you're going to see more, you've seen more successes, you've seen more, um, I guess, failures in, in terms of the ability to get at information. So if we could now take time, and I'm going to start with Claire. Uh, Claire, if you could, and we're going to ask all the panelists to respond to this, um, in terms of the uh, success of using data, but also where the short, shortfalls were and where they continue to be, both in terms of data and also health inf IT infrastructure. So we'll Absolutely. start with you. I know that's a lot, but. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to be as brief as possible. I think the success- It's about, you get about four minutes, so you oh, get perfect. time. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that I've been thinking a lot pertaining to the COVID-19 database is that what we can see from this real world data, the data that's naturally collected through the daily operations of our health system, I think it's been incredible to see how data rich our health system is, but I think the real challenge we see is that we are information poor, which means that we're struggling to convert this richness of data into actionable information at the clinician level, at the policy level, at the local, state, and federal level. I think there has been significant frustration. How can we move data to information? And the simultaneously, I think our conception of what is health data is expanding. So as we've all talked about, these SDOH, the SDOH data, this has been one of the most popular mm -hmm. data linkages we've seen with the COVID-19 database is taking data that tells us a ability to pay income and attaching it to those traditional health sources. We have this knowledge now, we, we know 
the evidence, um, if we're going to ask real questions about health equity, particularly in the wake of the pandemic, we need to broaden our conception of what is health relevant data. So we have all of this data richness, we're struggling to commit it, to convert it into information. I think what we've seen in the database is that if we can link these siloed data sources and make them securely available in a de-identified manner to non-commercial researchers, the evidence that is generated is humbling. So we have seen um, a, some research on telehealth and telemedicine, how it was inequitably available in the wake of the pandemic. There was, um, we just, there's a blog post on the website. We just worked with a few of our, our, um, our collaborators on sort of a pre-publication about vaccine efficacy. We have so much data that can give us insight on vaccine efficacy, but it's very silent. So we looked at the data available in the database to see what are we seeing about breakthrough just naturally in the data available as opposed to in cohorts, prospective cohorts looking forward. So I think it's very exciting when we are we find these bright spots of linking the data and making it available to the researchers who have the analytic muscles to wrestle with it. Um, I think we all need to, as an epidemiologist, we all need to get more comfortable with these types of data sets. I was trained on NHANES and our traditional the Framingham data set. Um, we're in a new chapter of health data. We need data that's real time, that's linkable, that is in a different scale than surveys. So I think um, that would be my call to action is us all getting better at wrestling this data um, from data to information. And I think one of the biggest weaknesses I see, one of the biggest roadblocks, even if everyone who's listening to this and our entire community of practice and public health got more familiar with real world data, data linkages and working with de-identified data sets, if we all got more comfortable tomorrow, what is the obstacle before us? The database as it currently stands does not incorporate state vaccine registries. We still have these silos across the private and public sectors when it comes to our health data. And it's a real tragedy because we don't have a clear picture of, for instance, the critical questions of who is vaccinated and who is unvaccinated in the country currently. So all of the questions related to that, there are certain fundamental limitations because at a national level, the state registries are not connected to our claims and EHR data sets that might have separate vaccine data. And as we look at boosters, as we look at some of these downstream questions about the pandemic, there's certain there's certain limitations to what we can do because of these silos across the public and private sector. So I, I'm interested in what the other panelists have to say about that, because I think that to me is one of the, the biggest limitations I'm seeing in our work with the COVID-19 database, as well as with the work um, I, I'm seeing in the literature uh, uh, right now. I haven't seen anyone solve it on a national level yet, but I'm, I'm ready to be proven wrong. So I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Okay, um, and I'm, I'm going to uh, switch a little bit and go to Niall, since both of you are, are working together. Um, so Niall, if you want to comment, uh, what the success, what were the failures, what continues to be the failures? Uh, well, first of all, Claire stole all the brilliant insights, so anything I say is going to be uh, uh, profoundly uh, lacking. But for me, um, I think the, you know, our response uh, to COVID from a data ecosystem perspective was sort of muddling through. Uh, and I think you had uh, a lot of uh, private sector innovation uh, like the COVID-19 research database and a lot of local uh, excellence um, like uh, what Craig and his guys are, are doing in Cincinnati. But, you know, I, I was just from the very beginning and still to a certain extent remain kind of shocked that we sort of struggled for reliable national level estimates. I mean, I mean, you have to remember that literally in order for us to have a good sense of what was going on with COVID hospitalizations and tests that like volunteer organizations were set up, the COVID tracking project to, you know, um, scrape data from, um, from available uh, available state uh, resources. I think it, you know, also frankly highlighted, you know, we have lots and lots and lots of administrative data that's pretty old, uh, uh, but somewhat connected. And we have lots and lots and lots of clinical data 
that's super real time, but really hard to, you know, abstract out and use in a, um, uh, in a meaningful way. So uh, I think those are the things uh, that we really need to focus on on fixing uh, going forward. Uh, how do we, uh, because, you know, it's great to know, um, you know, the number of hospitalizations or, or the number of tests, but, you know, we what we really need is not to be, you know, relying on, there were so many insights and New York Times and Washington Post headlines based on studies of like 250 patients at a hospital in New York. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Healthcare is 20% of our economy and, you know, we've invested, you know, tens or hundreds of billions of dollars in enabling a, um, a better HIT uh, infrastructure over the last 20 years and we're relying on, you know, um, surveys or, you know, of, of 250 patients in, in a hospital in New York to drive our, our understanding of what's going on or relying on uh, analyses of vaccine uh, efficacy uh, among um, the Israeli population uh, to inform us of, um, uh, of you know, what's going on with vaccines. And so, you know, Claire uh, alluded to this too. I, I think, you know, in, in the all hands on deck moment we had uh, in trying to get as many people vaccinated as possible, and of course, I'll ignore the, the elephant in the room of our shamefully lagging uh, vaccination rate uh, nationally. Uh, you know, the, the fact that my, my vaccination information exists in a DC vaccine registry that doesn't talk to, you know, any other um, piece of healthcare data about myself. Uh, my health insurer doesn't know that I'm vaccinated because, uh, you know, I tried to show my card at the DC convention center and was told, um, told not to. So, um, you know, I think all those things as we, you know, both retrospectively look back to assess how we did and prospectively begin to plan, you know, for a more connected future and a better response to the next pandemic. I think those are the things we need to do. Okay, thank you. And Craig? The Cleveland, no, Cincinnati experience. Hey now, hey now, hey now. <laughs> I'll never do that again. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, it, the, you know, it's like it's asking how many data problems there were during the pandemic. It's you know, it's kind of like how much time you got because uh, you're going on and on and on. But I will say that the fact that we had already in place uh, um, the interfaces with all the labs, national and local, in our market, and all the legal agreements, the governance all worked out in advance. Uh, enabled us to really quickly uh, provide situational awareness about uh, early on we were running about 36 hours before the states um, had their data uh, out and uh, you know in pandemic time a day and a half is a lot and so we uh, we really leveraged existing MPIs and a lot of the infrastructure and fortunately had the talent um, to be able to exploit all that uh, for the crew um, uh, as a wise man told me he said, if you uh, wait for the pandemic to arrive, you're too late. You got to get those agreements in place be beforehand. So that's that's probably our big lesson. Uh, the other lesson is that we, um, you know, we're, we're kind of like plumbers. Um, very, it, the team is a bunch of really good plumbers, but we realized quickly we didn't have the data science ch chops to really serve our community. And so having those kind of partnerships in place, the fact that the CEO of Cincinnati Children's said, Craig, handpick your team, whoever you ne need, you know, that was very fortuitous. Uh, we had a hard time getting public health data because understandably they're like, who are these people? You know, it's a little team of 70 people in Cincinnati. Um, and so the unbelievable workarounds to get um, all the public health data that all the hospitals and health departments wanted us to have because we could blend it across three states and, and all that. Um, was was just hellacious. And so uh, I think that on the policy side, we need kind of a break the glass strategy where, you know, the governors could have deemed us safe and reliable. We're high-tech, uh, high certif high-trust certified. I mean, we've been moving clinical data for 20 years. So um, it, believe it or not, we ended up having to get all health commissioners to write a le uh, letters, 14 health commissioners to write letters 
to send them up to Columbus to get tell them that we were working on their behalf. And it's just, you know, we just need to, we, now that we know we've got those in place, but um, I would encourage anybody on this, uh, in, at this meeting to uh, think think about the legal infrastructure, that, uh, not just the technical. Oh, well, thank you. And, and maybe on a national basis too. Um, yeah. So that again, I like that breaking the glass. Uh, yeah, breaking that glass ceiling. Thank you. <laughs> Helen? Well, I think Niall really hit it on the head where never before in the history of healthcare have we spent so much money on technologies than at this point in time. Everyone has some type of technology that they utilize. And we saw in this pandemic data sitting in silos un unusable or um, unreachable when in fact possibly the data was sitting there. I love Claire's idea and I took actually a few little notes because the data is there. We have to be able to, be, uh, to uh, retrieve it, to have it secure, and for it to talk to each other regardless of where the data is being fed from. And that's where that platform, a, an agnostic platform that's fire standards, really can pull all the data in, assimilate it, put it in real time, and have it acted upon. We must be very careful as a nation not to at all get anyone's um, HPI or any confidential healthcare information in the wrong hand. So while this was an extremely emotional time for us, we must protect the privacy of each and everyone's healthcare and not um, compromise that. So I think looking at it, people realize that yes, we had technology, but was it really practical in any given time? The silos were the things that oftentimes were unsurmountable. And I think that if things were more communicative in regards to data sharing without affecting uh, um, the confidentiality issue, I think that was brought front and center. Okay. And um, is it going to be Mary Beth or Josh responding to this question? I think that'll be me. Okay, Josh. So, uh, you know, in, in terms of whether it was a, uh, you know, a crisis that, that accelerated in, uh, initiatives and innovation, I think it's sort of the, the former triggering the latter. Um, when we started, Mary Beth and myself, it was, you know, March 15th is a Sunday afternoon. Data was coming flooding in. We're in New York State, right? That's that's where everything was happening in the beginning. And so what we had to address uh, needed near real-time data response. We have a variety of systems with the Department of Health that have various needs met, but we did not have something in place that was going to facilitate, you know, the, the response to the pandemic that was needed just based on how how incredibly contagious and how quickly it was spreading, especially in New York City. So, you know, that that lack was the catalyst for us building, literally me on a laptop started building uh, the systems that were required to facilitate the reporting out. Um, at that point in time, there were the daily press conferences that seemed to be national news, right? They're being mm -hmm. followed very closely to see what was happening here. Um, but we, we saw quickly, we saw early that, you know, the data silo point that we've heard made so many times, uh, we needed to have, you know, the ability to look across the breadth of the sources the Department of Health has access to, right? And we're in a very different position from many of the other presenters and that we are the Department of Health. And so for New York State, we can pretty quickly work with our colleagues and address any kind of MOUs or DUAs that need to be put in place to get that data because of the, the criticality and the urgency needed. So. We invested in, you know, linking initiatives, as, as, as Claire mentioned, we invested in our own master person identifiers. We are linking that data today. We are bringing it all together. We are looking at it holistically. And we, we learned our lesson quickly, right? And we have begun initiatives to set forth the stage to be able to do this in a, at a faster pace with a more broad scale of data in the future. We have, you know, in our, in our team here, the access to medical records, we have access to vaccine data, we have access to immunization data, to the claims data, to the coverage data, right? Did this person not get something because they simply didn't have coverage at that time? 
um, and, and everything else that I had mentioned earlier. And so by bringing all of that together, uh, we are able to see much more holistically and much more, I think, accurately uh, what it is that is occurring. Um, and I, I do want to, to kind of caveat that is not without challenge, as, as folks mentioned before. There's administrative data that we've had forever and folks are very comfortable with in the world of, of fire and, and, and medical records. Things are newer and, and they're not always as standardized and clean and ready to use as, as data that's been around for maybe claims processing for the last 30 years and has been very tightly groomed and, and prepped. So uh, it definitely was a catalyst for us. You know, we worked around the clock to try and do what we could to make the information needed uh, available to our leaders. And, and there, there's still there's still much work to be done in order to be able to, to handle this type of event if it were to occur again. Okay. Um, I have a few as, uh, questions that have come in from the audience now. And anyone can uh, submit a question too uh, that for the panelists, but I'm gonna go through some of the questions. And if you could raise your hand, the panelists, and let me know who wants to respond to these questions. Um, would you comment on the emergence of APIs and RESTful web services, FHIR, and any efforts you see or don't to connect all of the players engaged in effective pandemic response? Okay, <laughs> Craig? If you could answer, sure. Yes, sorry, didn't, didn't off mute. Uh, I'm not I'm not super deep technically, but I'm enthusiastic, very enthusiastic about the pandemic kind of bringing public health and uh, SNFs and other other parts of the ecosystem into the standards environment. Uh, folks may have seen that ONC recently uh, was given authority for um, uh, uh, pushing the standards agenda for public health standards, and that's going to be very uh, crucial. So I think that, frankly, I think we'll look back and see that a broader uh, public health ecosystem is part of, is, is, has grown up as a result of this, and it'll be based on um, APIs, FHIR. Niall, then Josh, and then Helen. Yeah, so first of all, uh, hi, Cousin Danny. Uh, thank you for asking that, uh, that excellent question. Um, so, um, you know, I think, um, Fire and APIs, um, they're all great, but if you don't have your fundamental sort of like data layer um, in, in place and, and, you know, functioning properly and kind of, you know, giving you uh, the information that you need, like they will just be APIing junk all over the place. So, you know, you, you have to have the core uh, the, the core data assets uh, in place, they have to be validated, they have to be timely, and then, you know, API the heck out of them. But, you know, uh, you, you, you need to avoid like a garbage in, garbage out problem. Josh? I 100% I agree with what Niall just said uh, in terms of, you know, if you, if you don't have quality data coming in, then it's kind of creating a bigger problem for you. Uh, I did want to speak to uh, actually utilizing Fire-based APIs during this process, uh, and maybe a different facet. Uh, our office had invested it in the validated healthcare directory, uh, which was you know recently sponsored by ONC, and we were able to take advantage of that for communications, uh, for you know rolling out vaccinations, understanding who was eligible to give vaccines, who we could communicate with to increase the the population of providers who could give out vaccines. Uh, when we were at that time, roughly last December. So, you know, when it comes to having that Firebase backend there and available, that was an asset we could take advantage of. So I'd like to kind of, you know, bolster that, that stance if, if possible. Thank you, Josh. And Helen? Yeah, I want to reaffirm what Josh said, because you really need a robust um, ingestion type engine for the data validation, because you've got to extract it, you've got to transform it, you've got to load all of it. And then once you have all of that data secured, um, then you're able to really act upon it in real time. So junk in, junk out, um, be able to have a data warehouse that is secure because remember, cyber attackers are out there. They need just a few little web links to zap you. And that's what we want to avoid given now all this sharing of data. We've got to be very, very sensitive that when we open those doors of sharing, so too do those people want to get their fingers in it. And it's really the patient's data should be secure 
at all times, regardless of who is using it and how. And I think fire standards, as Josh said, is really the safest, most um, sustainable as we move on, hopefully not to another pandemic, but hopefully the opioid crisis that is getting out of control now. Okay, thank you, Helen. And I, I just wanna raise um, a one question that's out there and a couple of people can respond to it is, um, from the studies that have gone on, what what finding, what was particularly relevant for a policy? What, Claire? Yeah, I can touch on just a, a couple quick ones. Um, I think the, the first one, or two studies, and I'll, I'll find them and I'll, I'll get them so they can be linked in the, in the chat. And I wanna touch on what Helen just said, the opioid epidemic, these are connected epidemics. The pandemic is very connected to a worsening of the opioid epidemic, it's showing up in the data. And we're seeing that from the researchers. There's two research groups that recently published, one from um, Michigan, Indiana, and one from um, Harvard, uh, the Harvard Health Policy researchers. And one, the Harvard group looked at um, medically assisted treatment prescriptions, and they were able to look at a bunch of claims, and they were able to see that nationally, um, we're seeing a crisis in people actively fulfilling those, those prescriptions during the pandemic. Um, and then we paired that, and we did a webinar with these two groups to, to kind of look at these two points together. The, the Michigan group looked at um, naloxone, so overdose uh, intervention, and mm -hmm. they were able to see that uh, naloxone prescriptions were underfilled. So we're seeing an decrease in medically assisted treatment, a decrease in overdose intervention <laughs> treatment. Um, and that was all available in just the natural data that was available in the database. And we're able to look at this in the pandemic time, this crisis, and we're not seeing the the, the trends, you know, come back up in, in the way we would expect now that, you know, we have reopening. So there's a lot of things for state policy um, to be learned in the natural data that's collected by the operations of our health system that can really help us figure out what the levers are for getting our arms around how the opioid epidemic has worsened during the pandemic time. So I'd say that was one piece. The, the other piece is school reopenings. We had one group um, that unpacked the school reopening policies. They tracked school reopenings. They layered that with COVID infection. And um, they weren't seeing a, a tight link between significant spikes and this was a while back i will say this is this is a few mm -hmm. months ago but a lot of states we know there were states that leaned on those researchers and their findings um for conversations on state policy on, on school reopenings state and local policies and uh there was a number of op-eds in the new york times um following that study uh, that that referenced that study uh, and, and it was clearly a, a core part of the debate um both you know in the public as well as at, at the state governance level so I'd, I'd say those are two big areas and I'll, I'll i'll find those studies and link them so that everyone can have them at their fingertips okay thank you thank you um now we're going to move on to another question um and and again this is because we have a variety of people's experiences on this call on this webinar in terms of um what information how was the COVID data collected from hospitals um, and uh, clinics was it independently did it go through associations did it go directly to you how, how did you get it and i guess how old was it josh i, I guess i can tackle that one because that was a big part of our lives for uh maybe a year well, still but that first year in particular. So I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, at a high level, we do have a hospital discharge system that our team is responsible for. Uh, it's, it's Sparks here in New York State. And that system has been around for, oof, my best correct me if I'm wrong, 40-ish years, uh, reliable use and research everywhere in New York. And, and uh, that data, however, has a cure period. Um, it's pre-adjudicated data. And you know, hospitals have various compliance metrics that would not have facilitated the needs that we had at that time. So we were getting, uh, in the very beginning, twice daily report outs from all of the hospitals in New York. A couple of hospitals had partners uh, reporting on their behalf. Maybe if they had a sister organization that reported for both entities. But you know, about 200 facilities submitting data at the hospital level, uh, twice daily. Um, and it was covering topics ranging from patients uh, to PPE needs to staff that could possibly help at other facilities. 
that then morphed into things such as vaccination uh, for staff if they had needs there um, or, or folks who, who couldn't comply for various reasons so that we could better estimate where to distribute vaccines to next. So, you know, data did at one point um, move from twice daily to once daily, which I was grateful for because the volume and, and, and type of data that we had, um, right, if you can imagine the, the load on the hospital at that point in time back in, in March of 20, April 20, the it would be hard for me to say like they were they were at a capacity to to do thorough data investigations prior to reporting to us right they had folks dying in front of them there was not a lot known at that time about how this this spread was was going to increase decrease pause uh, we were trying to flatten that curve and so we didn't always have the best data quality right i mean helen's mentioned a few times the need for for data cleansing and validation routines and we were getting raw data in from somebody typing it watching people die all around them um and so when that moved to once daily, um, you know, Mary Beth was was kind of leading the analytics side of that, and and those guys were putting out some really good information based on on what we got at that point in time. So very long winded way to say we got it once a day from the hospital's uh, patient facility level information, as well as various PPE and, and bed related data to help us plan for the surges as they occurred. Okay, seven days I'm, a week. Yeah. Oh, go on, Mary Beth. It was seven days. Yeah. No, it was it was seven days a week, as Josh was saying, and, and we're still collecting seven days a week. It was um, a very difficult time because, as everyone knows, New York was blindsided, not only in, during the time that Josh is talking about. We led the, the nation in positivity, but we led the world in positivity and the hospitals were having a especially the downstate hospitals were under crisis and we needed that date we needed that data in order to inform timely and accurate ways to protect the public health this was about you know as public servants josh and i have a primary responsibility of protecting public health and we needed to get that information out there for contact tracing for capacity, for ventilator use, for dialysis machines, for stand-up centers for additional beds. Um, it was difficult and a norm and a um, adjudicated or pre-adjudicated system such as a hospital discharge data system um, just did not have the timing that we needed. And so we stood up that survey system that is still going. Okay, great. I've got a, a several more questions. One of them uh, that I want to ask, and uh, there's two that really I want to get to. And one is, um, how have you engaged the academic university communities in building data warehouses and, and data release files that uh, can be useful in research? So how have they been engaged? Niall, I think you've worked with a, a number of universities. Okay. I'll take that to start. I mean, for my sins, I've been working with researchers for many years, um, both at CMS and HCCI, uh, and, you know, uh, enabled their access to uh, both Medicare and commercial data. Um, you know, this could go in a number of um, uh, different directions, but I think one of the important things to note with the COVID-19 research database was actually, you know, both CMS and HCCI give um, data to uh, to academics, but, you know, they charge a, a license fee because um, uh, there are, you know, bills to pay and uh, business models to uh, justify. I think what was unique about the, uh, the COVID-19 research database, and while it was only for COVID-19 related research is that this, you know, um, consortium of about 15 to 20 um, companies with pretty valuable and timely data assets, uh, some of whom I, prior to this, I would put a, have put pretty high in a list of companies I would never expect to see giving data away for free, gave it away for free um, to researchers because they thought it was, um, you know, uh, it was important to do, and we were in um, uh, we were in a crisis mode. There's a whole, you know, lot of other, you know, kind of arcana related to, you know, you know how you approach data governance with with, with researchers and, and different things like that. But, um, you know, uh, in general, researchers uh, love data, and they really, really, really love free data. <laughs> I just want to jump in and say, I, I, 
Niall and his team have been fundamental, the glue that's held sort of the academic and the governance piece to the private sector data sources piece, which data Band sort of um, taking over. And, and I think the, the partnership has been very key. And one thing working with the academic community is that I think the, the private sector realizes that, and I think the private sector partners who have volunteered their data have actually really enjoyed this working relationship with the academic sector, that these are these are partners who didn't have an easy button for engaging with academics. And what we realize is a growing respect from the private sector that to generate evidence for policy, we need to make sure data is available to the people with the skills, the background, the professional credentials to wrestle with it. And I think that that partnership, that consortium in, I mean, the database came together in six weeks. We had our first researchers on the database in, in a, a matter of days. That, that efficiency, and I think that was our own little break glass moment. And I, I just hope that we can expand on that and include, we have some CDC researchers and FDA researchers sort of interested in engaging with the database. I hope that we can continue to expand that, um, that relationship with our public sector partners, because I think that academic to private sector uh, engagement was, was truly, to Niall's point, it, it, was, it was a really lovely um, coming together. Um, and, and the last question for all of you, and this sort of ties into, um, you know, APCD and all, all different types of uh, databases. Um, you know, sharing siloed information can be messy. Uh, this is the question. Centralizing might offer, disad might offer advantages by having a single source of truth and a clean way to do extracts. But are there disadvantages to putting all your data eggs in one basket? What do you see for the future? Naya? Uh, well, the biggest disadvantage is nobody really wants to do it, right? Um, I think uh, we really, uh, you only have to uh, look at the No Surprises Act um, legislation and the debates around that, which um, openly uh, contemplated a national APCD structure, which I was violently in favor of, uh, but the uh, the final bill uh, uh, devolved uh, instead to uh, a much more state uh, APCD uh, focused approach. And again, what was, uh, I think that, you know, um, sharing data is hard, uh, but honestly, I'll make sharing data way harder than it should be. Uh, people, um, culture, inertia, and lawyers. Uh, and so, um, again, I don't want to talk um, too, you know, too much um, about Dean Research Database, but as Claire said, this literally came together in, in six weeks. And so that was a, a complex web you know, data data use agreements and legal negotiations with companies who are, are actually predisposed, you know, not to widely share their data. And it, to me, it really highlighted that uh, where there is a will, um, there is a way. Now, um, you know, um, I, I'd actually not like to uh, have there be another um, existentially threatening global pandemic uh, in the near future, but I am hoping that, um, we can draw some lessons on how we can uh, more um, effectively share data and you know, try and break down uh, some of that uh, inertia that has um, traditionally just really bogged down this entire space. Okay. And uh, Craig, I see you, you've got your hand up too, so. Yeah, I'm going to do a counter counterfactual to my uh, good friend now, Brennan. There, the 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 um, alternative to a national. I think first of all, I think it's both. So I suspect we agree. But um, there's there's more you can do locally than you can nationally. There's no question about it. So you know, you, you can get enough people. Uh, I call it medium data. You can get data stewards in a room physically. Mm -hmm. in a pandemic, and uh, everybody can look each other in the eye and build up the trust bank and then do cool stuff together. And so you know that's. Uh, that's my, I'm a one trick pony. That's, that's what I'm particularly excited about is watching communities and states come together and, and um, do something that we just don't appear to have the will to do nationally at this point. Um, to that point, Norm asked me to mention this. Uh, 
uh, in three days, we will officially launch a new organization, which is the result of a merger of a couple national groups. It's called Civitas Networks for Health. And these are uh, uh, over 100 organizations across the country, pretty much all of the health information exchanges, um, all the um, uh, local uh, regional health improvement collaboratives uh, coming together using data to improve outcomes and reduce costs at the community mm -hmm. level. And so we invite you to check out that page or uh, Norm, Norm and our team will be working very closely together. And, and so we're excited to support you guys um, and, and uh, over time. Hey Craig, we we know we know we know you're a one trick pony, but that would be a good trick. Thanks, Niall. <laughs> okay. Anyone else want to respond to that? Uh, Josh. Yeah. So, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have uh, you know, the team responsible for New York State's all payer database. Uh, I, the question I think asked is: Is there risk in putting all of your data eggs in one basket? I would say uh, if you didn't at least prepare to have all of your data coming together, then you're probably at a greater risk than if you had done so. Um, does it maybe make from a security perspective one target or one asset that people might focus on? Sure. But the the wealth of information um, and the amount of time, right? I mean, that's where I think Claire and, and Niall have highlighted they, they were able to do that so quickly, right? Because that usually takes considerable time. If you put all legal things aside, you know, everyone's got a DUA on file. Great, we've got this mountain of data in front of us. Turning that into meaningful information is not a short task. Uh, things that aren't standardized, you know, if there's values in a field that just simply aren't what they should be because of X, Y, or Z reason, there's a lot of work there uh, to get that data usable and, and reliable enough for policy making, right? So uh, I think the, the risk is, is, is far less than the reward of having a system uh, that would allow for the research that you can do when you bring everything together, which is, you know, I'm, I'm saying that because we are doing something like that. And I strongly believe in that case. And, um, you know, I, I think what Niall and Craig both shared as well about, you know, uh, things occurring at a national level or even a regional level um, is something I've thought previously. I think Craig mentioned he's in the tri-state area by Cincinnati there. You know, New York State, obviously, we have Connecticut, we have New Jersey, we have Massachusetts, Vermont, all these states that border folks who commute for work. So when we look at like an all-payer database, we might be seeing residents of a different state or a neighboring state. And same thing goes for our hospital discharge system. They were maybe skiing in New York and broke a leg and we're in a New York state healthcare facility. And that information is in New York and maybe another state has it. But um, I think there's, there's opportunity. I, I don't know what the fastest and, and, and most viable path forward is, but there's opportunity for for data sharing, I think at a, at a regional level where it may be more manageable than it would be at a national level, um, you know, it, it, and I'm gonna go for a perspective. Okay, thank you, thank you. And it, it sounds like the the advantages are, are there to have um, a centralized database, but it's at what level? Is it, you know, your city? Is it your town? Is it your state? Is it national? and also uh, to have that information at your fingertips. So, because a lot of this is local. Um, I, I live in Illinois and I can tell you right now, we have data on every county, every community area in Chicago, and it is actionable uh, because you have that data and uh, able to see the trends. Mm -hmm. There is one question that came in uh, that I uh, hope we can address too. And this deals with, you know, we talked about there's a lot of hospital data. There's getting to be more vaccination data, more uh, certainly death data, infection data. But can anyone comment on the challenges or the successes that they've had of working with qualified health centers, the FQHCs, the federally qualified health centers, with HIT and COVID? Uh, when they serve a large number of patients that are uninsured, no claims, Medicare or Medicaid data sources. So um, how have you been addressing the FQHCs? Well, we have, we have clinical data. So, um, uh, but as you point out, no, no claims data for uninsured folks. I, I, I'll use this an occasion to just to remind us all not to have technophilia, sometimes getting the data doesn't have to be that hard. And I would argue Cincinnati, very since very early on, has some of the best last mile vaccination data anywhere in the country, but based on talking to folks. And uh, 
how that happened is uh, one of one of my colleagues just does a phone call every day, checks in, and everybody comes in. They re just report out all the hospitals, all the practices, all the health departments, uh, Kroger, CBS, and um, and you know. So it's a, sometimes the in, in in the midst of a crisis, uh, the best answer is is not always just fancy. Okay. Thank you. I'm, we're now getting towards the end and I'm gonna give each of you a magic wand and you get to make one wish. And so if you can tell, tell everyone what your one wish would be for going forward and, and, and how you're gonna make it happen. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm gonna start in the order that we started with to begin with. Um, at Josh or Mary Beth? Josh and Mary Beth, do you want to both comment? We both get a magic wand? All right, I'll, yes, I'll, I'll do my magic, magic wand. wand first. I won't make okay. you share at this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think if there's a way that we can work collaboratively together to get the complex interplay of what's actually needed to inform healthcare in a state of crisis, be it um, you know, the domestic violence, the opioid, the COVID, everything that happened in terms of the result of a complete shutdown is uh, in pause and get that data that we talked a lot about, which was hospitalizations and claims interplayed seamlessly with capacity, bed capacity, the number of beds, um, where beds are needed, where equipment's needed, and then tie that into vital events. Because if you think about all the different systems that went into Niall's term earlier, the ecosystem of response to COVID, mm -hmm. it was the surveillance systems for testing, um, for contact tracing. It was the administrative and the survey data. It was the vital event data to inform provisional or confirmed or presumed fatalities and to get that system data interplayed with the actual healthcare data into an informative system that could predict where excess PPE is needed, where PPE potentially needs to be stockpiled, where it doesn't need to be stockpiled, where monoclonal antibody treatment is needed, where um, vaccine effectiveness, is it working, is it not working? I recently published an MMWR with some of my colleagues on vaccine effectiveness. And I gotta tell you, when you're using a surveillance system, it is different than a claim system and it is different than a vital event system and it is different than a bed capacity system. And I probably went over my time, but that's my magic wand. You got a lot of wishes there, <laughs> but again, great wishes. Let's Josh? do it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the very brief wish uh, outside of wider spread vaccine adoption would be uh, just for the, the things like the Da Vinci Project uh, that I think could could promote some of this, right? Not necessarily endorsing that one in particular, but the the federal API initiatives, uh, the national level API initiatives that could maybe facilitate some of this with the standards in place. Uh, those things coming to fruition, maturing, I think those are the types of, of infrastructure pieces with the quality components that support data that's usable and readily available by API um, I think that would alleviate a lot of the lift and build that many of us had to do in order to facilitate our, our work efforts during the pandemic. Okay, thank you. Helen, quick wish. I, uh, I really think we need to take the emotional conversations out of the physical um, situations like this pandemic. We've got to rely on unbiased data set um, and set on standards such as fire so we can make practical uh, decisions, and we can't sacrifice patient confidentiality for emotional convenience. Okay, Niall? I'd really like every single state vaccine registry to be um, brought together, all that data be pooled and merged to uh, health insurance information uh, for people who have health so we could have a, 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 a really clear picture of who's been vaccinated and who has not. Thank you. And Craig? 
Uh, my wish is that I would not be on a panel again with now Brennan. Uh, if I have a second wish, <laughs> it is that um, uh, that we work together as a community to make it easier and cheaper for local leaders to lead using data. That uh, shouldn't be so hard. It shouldn't be so expensive to put uh, information insight into the hands of people uh, who have authority for their community and state. Thank you. And Claire? Final word. I want all of these wishes. And on top of that, I think a better education for us policymakers, for us in the community about threading this needle, preserving patient privacy, and getting data in the hands of people who need it. I think there's a lot of complexity there. And if I could wave a magic wand, we'd all be able to hold that complexity at once. <laughs> I, I think by, you know, working together and, and coming together like we are right now, it really does create that environment for us really uh, that we do have the opportunity through NATO and different organizations, but especially through NATO because we've, we're all NATO members. We've all been working on this for years. And again, I think this is the time. The time is now. I want to thank all of you uh, for the panelists, uh, for the attendees as well, but uh, the, uh, the panelists, not only for being on this panel and sharing your thoughts and your, your aspirations uh, for the future and um, connecting us with what's working and what's not working, it's for everything that you've done during this pandemic, because sometimes it, we realize how important data and information is in times like this and how it's just necessary to guide policy and to save lives. So thank you all for being on the panel. And again, it's been a wonderful discussion and I've enjoyed being with you and I've learned a lot too. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>